started once I see the little, there it is. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ashley Campbell. I'm a security specialist here in the state and local government um, organization at Microsoft. I have with me Andrea Fisher. Andrea, do you want to say hello? Sure, everyone. Hi, I'm Andrea Fisher, Ashley's technical partner in crime. Great to be here with you today. So we're here today to talk about traditional SOC challenges. I'm sure all of you are facing it where we have so many alerts coming in. We have not enough skills or security folks on our teams. We need more automation and we have too many products. The reason we think our SIM is, is better than your traditional SIM, say if you have a, a Splunk or a QR, we are a fully cloud-based SIM. There's no infrastructure cost. You only pay for what you use. Uh, you can bring a lot of your Office 365 data for free, uh, particularly if you're an E5 stack. It's a really cost effective SIM because we allow, allow you to, to bring in all those alerts for free. We have a predictable billing. You can see what your billing is going to be throughout the month. You can run queries. You can look at workbooks. Um, Andrea will show you all of those. And it's a flexible model. You can scale up and scale down. So we also give discounts for commitment tiers. Uh, so like if you start going over 100 gigs per day, you can scale up to a commitment tier and that'll give you more savings. We are pre-wired for all of our, or most of our Microsoft solutions. I, I never want to say all because you never know, but it's called service to service. So it's literally the slide of a button to, to get the Microsoft logs. We have connectors for many third parties. Andrea will show those off, but things like your Palos, your Cisco's, all available, even CrowdStrike. And anything that's not available can always be ingested, or we don't have a pre-built connector, can be ingested via Syslog or Ceph. Our tool offers automation through Azure Logic Apps if you're using Azure Logic Apps elsewhere. So you can immediately take action on an alert if it's triggered. This is a view of Microsoft's vision of SIM. There on the left where it says Microsoft 365 Defender, that's, that's the E5, G5 portfolio today. So things like your Office 365, uh, Defender for Office, Endpoints, Defender for Endpoint, Identity, Apps. We want all of that feeding up into Azure Sentinel. And um, as you build out into the cloud, we also have Azure Defender to protect your VMs, your containers, uh, your storage. And so the cool thing about Azure Defender is we have bi-directional functionality, which is to me, it's the future of SIM. What that means is if I close an alert in Azure Defender, it closes it in Sentinel and vice versa. We also do that for Snow, and um, I can only can see it continuing immediately for the other Microsoft 365 uh, components. So super cool innovation there. I also wanted to share that we do have a benefit going on right now for G5 E5 customers. Between now and December 1st, any E5 customer can also bring in 100 megs uh, per user per month of the other Microsoft sources. So Azure Active Directory sign-in and audit logs are super awesome. Andrea will probably show that off on the visualizations you can see there. And then the, you can also bring in the other logs, uh, you know, as long as you don't cap out at 100 megs per day. In addition to our always free logs, which are um, Microsoft Cloud App Security Alerts, uh, Defender for Endpoint Alerts, so on and so forth from the E5 suite. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Andrea to demo and no more boring slides. Good morning, everybody. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to um, take a look at the Sentinel interface, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to jump right into it. I'm going to get my screen shared here. So this is the main Sentinel landing page where you can see events, alerts, you can see recent incidents, if I had any potential malicious events, but I don't usually really like to start here. I like to start here in the get started section uh, just to talk about setting up 
a STEM tool. I always say I'm old, so we didn't used to call it STEAM, but a lot of people call it STEAM now, but just know that I'm old enough that we don't pronounce the E. The 66th day of the year, we said, look at this. It's in, uh, here's more predictive programming. Thank you. Uh, so one of the last projects I did before I came to Microsoft was at a uh, financial services company in Florida, and it was a SIM project, and it ended up taking us twice as many servers, twice as much storage, and twice as much time as we thought it did, or we thought it would. And that's one of the great things about Sentinel to me is it literally can be stood up in about five minutes, right? You don't need any servers, you don't need any storage because all of that is in the cloud. So what are we gonna do when we set up this tool? We're gonna collect data, we're gonna alert on the data and then automate our response to that data. So to collect the data, we can either click on data connectors or here. We have a couple of different kinds of data connectors. You can see right now we have 119 existing connectors, 100 more coming before the end of the year. And I won't make you dizzy by scrolling through the list, but just so you know, we've got Amazon, Citrix, Cisco, Big IP, Palo. Um, if I, I just always say, if you've got the data, we can take it in. That can be on-premises, in the cloud, from you know Google, from AWS, from the different firewalls, whatever you got, we can take it. So normally I start by showing how easy it is to connect the Microsoft data. So there's probably 20 built-in Microsoft connectors and uh, we click on that data connector. Again, there's somebody who isn't muted. Can somebody mute for me? Um, uh, so Azure Active Directory, we're gonna open. I think someone muted Andrea. Hang on. <laughs> All right, I unmuted myself. Um, but uh, once we decide to onboard a data connector, we can read a little bit about what we will get. So here you can see we're going to learn about application usage, conditional access policies, legacy authentication, information about self-service password reset, and things like group management. Uh, we give you a really easy to understand interface. Here are the prereqs. And if you've got green check marks, you are good to go. If you've got a red X, there's a problem. And it'll tell you, is it permissions? Is it licensing? Right? It's going to be super clear for you. But here you can see there's literally check boxes. And we check these boxes and apply the changes. And within minutes, that data is onboarding. And that is the same, whether it's Azure Active Directory, Azure Active Directory Identity Protection. I know today we're gonna to talk a lot about identity and how the tools can help you with that. Uh, so again, we can bring in Azure Active Directory Identity Protection, literally just click that connect button, Defender for Identity, any of those simple direct connection. We also have what we call agented, right? And those are things like your DNS servers, your domain controllers, your file servers. For things like that, we're actually gonna download an agent and install that on the machine. And that will let us ingest those directly up to Sentinel. Uh, you could also use Windows event forwarding if that's your methodology. We have what we call syslog server with agent. So that would be almost any of your networking devices like Cisco, Palo, Fortinet, most of those are going to require a syslog server. You can take a peek at one of these really quickly just so you have an idea. So you'll create a Linux syslog server, or hopefully you already have one. And this will walk you through the steps, right? We have it install the Linux agent onto your server. You're going to run this particular command. Make sure you've got listening on port 514. We've got some really easy to step through instructions for you on what you need to do, literally one, two, three, to walk through that process, and you have that data flowing in, right? Uh, so honestly, like I said, the setup, while I won't lie, it's a little boring, but it is easy, right? So it's literally some checkboxes, maybe building a syslog server, but once that data is ingested, 
we can really quickly just take a look here. If it's green, that means it's onboarded. And you can always see when the last log was received. Of course, mine's not gonna, this is my little lab environment, so uh, it does not have many real users, but you can see the logs were received eight minutes ago. And you can see the little green handshake showing that the data is flowing into those logs. Once we have all of that coming in, now we want to alert on that data, right? We want to see if there's anything funky going on with uh, all of that information. So we come into here, and this is the analytics section. I wish we call it alerts, but you know, this is Microsoft and we never really call it anything that makes sense. Um, but you know, here's where we think about what alerts do we want to enable, right? Are we, did we just turn on the Office 365 connector? If so, let's bring in the Office alerts. But again, today we're talking about identity and zero trust with identity, which of course means we didn't really lay the groundwork for that, I guess. One of the important things with zero trust, right? That new idea is trust no one, right? We used to live in a wonderful world where the office was the castle, there was a moat around that castle, and to get data, you had to come inside the castle. Well, as we know, that has eroded, especially post-COVID, and everyone is sitting everywhere. Um, so we want to not trust any location. We want to make sure that everyone is who they say they are, and multiple ways to do that, including here with Sentinel. You can see that I have 152 active roles. I can create my own anytime I want to, or take any of these existing rule templates and adjust them to meet my needs. When it comes to turning on those rule templates, we can decide we're just going to turn on every single high alert, or we're going to turn on, this, these are the MITRE tactics here, so maybe we're going to turn on every single work alert that has to do with lateral movement or exfiltration. You get to decide your methodology, my methodology. So I come in here and we just turned on the Azure Active Directory connector, right? Because we're worried about identity. So we're going to come in here and we're going to pick the data source of Azure Active Directory. We're going to say OK. And then th these are all of the rules that are available to us. Now, these templates here have been created by Microsoft or by one of the partners like Citrix or Cisco. Right, and they have been pre-designed to look for specific uh, bad activity that we are aware of and things like that. You can see here if it says in use, it means I've already turned them on. My philosophy again is if a high alert, I am turning it on. If you are interested, we can read, you know, what do we get if we turn this alert on? If I turn this one on, it's going to identify instances where service credential service principal credentials were added to an application by one user after admin rights, right? So you can read what it's going to do for you. You can see, do you have those logs enabled? And I do, right? We can see the green handshake. What's the MITRE tactic here? Here's the query it's going to actually run, and it's going to run every day looking for activity over the last two days. Now, all of that can be edited by you, right? So you can change the name, you can change the tactics, you can decide you think this should be a low alert or a high alert. You can change the logic, right? Maybe we're gonna change this and we're gonna look back three days, or maybe we're gonna look for some other features. In the beginning, I recommend you don't change a thing, but just know everything can be edited here. We can run a quick simulation to see if there's any data in our environment that matches this. Doesn't look like for me right now, nothing. So that's good news. And again, we can walk our way through here. And one of the most valuable things is turning on the automated responses to these. So absolutely, we want to respond to these alerts and take a look at it with our human eyeballs. But, you know, one of the struggles with our security posture these days, you know, sometimes these things are happening at two o'clock in the morning or on Saturday afternoon. And if we don't respond to these alerts immediately, we could be giving attackers, you know, 12, 24, 48 hours before we take human action. So I have a lot of things that can be automatically done when this rule fires. 
I can isolate the machine. I can block an IP address. I can block a user. I can reset a password, right? All of that action can be taken automatically when the alert fires, or I can do it myself at the click of a button. Then we can review and create and create the alert eventually. There we go. Once that has been created, we can see again that it is now in use. So there's a bunch of different kinds of rules as well. And you can see this one is letting me know there's an actual update, right? Microsoft has changed the logic of this particular alert so I can actually click on it and update it if I want to take that Microsoft update. Uh, but there's a bunch of different kinds of alerts here too. You can see there's security alerts, fusion alerts, scheduled alerts. The fusion alert, and there is only one, but the fusion alert is the most important alert in all of Sentinel. It is based on machine learning algorithms that look across the timestamps, the IP addresses, the users. It's looking across all of those things to see if its magic can correlate those things. Often our human eyeballs, right, we'll see a couple of yellow alerts and we'll be like, Meh, let's just close those out, no big deal. But what we want is for that machine learning, we'll notice things that we may not have, right? Like I said, again, the timestamp, things like that. And we're constantly adding new detections into Fusion. Uh, one of the newest ones we've just added is looking for crypto mining, looking for credential harvesting, uh, looking for beacon patterns and multiple password resets, followed by uh, suspicious activity. All kinds of stuff goes into this single alert. Then we have a few others. We have the machine learning these Microsoft security ones here, again, are based on templates and um, you can use these to create templates of your own and edit these any way that you want to. And then the scheduled ones um, can also be changed as well, right? So once we have all of this set up, and this is what I call, like I said, this is the boring part, right? Getting the alerts turned on, getting the data brought in. Then we have the fun part, right, which is we start getting incidents. And again, this is my fun little lab environment. So uh, I don't always have the most exciting stuff in here. But we were talking again about identity. So let's take a look at this uh, brute force attack against the Azure portal, right? So I can click on this particular alert. Now, if you're using something like ServiceNow or Jira, we do have a connector. And so that can open a ticket over in those tools. Or if you don't have something like that, you can manage it here, right? I can assign this to a person, either to me, someone else, or a group. And then I have best practice, right? Take it from new to active. Let's pop in here and let's look at the details of it. Oops, what happened? Go back, go back. Let's view the full details. There we go. And, you know, I'm going to take a quick peek at this, these Adele, right? And this IP, I don't recognize that IP. I'm going to, you know, what? I want to get some more information. The whole point of what we want you to do here is to quickly be able to decide, can I close the alert? Do I need to take action? Do I need more information, right? Those are the three things that you need to know here. So what we're going to do is we're gonna run a couple of those playbooks we talked about, right, the automation. So I want more information about that IP. So I'm gonna click that get information from IP. And then I wanna know, has that user in the have I been owned database? I'm gonna run that, right? So these are the ones that I can run at my discretion. Then I'm gonna hit a little refresh. I'm gonna pop into the comments. And I can see that that IP address 70.127 is from Tampa, which is good because that's where, right, that's where Adele sits. And we can also see, but Adele has been identified as a compromised account in Have I Been Owned. So here's where you have to make a decision. Am I going to go? I mean, honestly, what I would do um, is probably do a little bit more research, but maybe I decided here right on the spot that that's good enough for me and I'm going to run the playbook that closes, it's going to log her out of all of those sign-in sessions, and it's going to reset her password. I could do that right here 
on the spot. Uh, or maybe I'm going to go do more research. And maybe let's dig in here. There's some great UEBA, right? User Entity Behavioral Analysis features that we can run on the identity. And we can get some more information about Adele here, right? Who is she? She's a retail manager. She works for Miriam. She sits in Bellevue in building 18, right? Uh, and what do we know about Adele here, right? So the UEBA is building a profile across time and peer groups, and it's looking for anomalous activities and giving us any insights to this particular user. So, and unlike a lot of other UEBA solutions, even our own, um, like Defender for Identity, uh, some of those will take up to 30 days to start learning behavior. This one literally takes minutes. So the minute it starts getting data, it's building you this profile. And we can see when we look at Adele's activity, and I'm looking over the last 30 days, but we could be more specific and granular. And what do I know about this user? Multiple failed login attempts, quite a few of them. And then we see a brute force attack. Now, again, this is my lab. So you normally see things in here like user logged into SharePoint, user logged into Exchange. I don't have real users in here, so everything they do is bad. Uh, but you can get that view over time of whether something is suspicious or not, right? Can I close the ticket? And then we have the insights. This user has had a password change. That could be suspicious. What else do we know? We could see, uh, has this user been added to a privileged group? Has this user cleared the event logs on a server? All of that would be available to us over here on the insights side. Or maybe you're a visual person, right? Maybe you like to see things in a graph form, right? So look, here's this chart, and now we can see, wow, that looks like a lot more suspicious, right? We can click on Adele and again, get some more information on that timeline and the entities involved. We can hover over Adele's name and see if there's anything else we should know about her, right? Now it looks like everything is good, but we could see that there are more things that we need to worry about, right? Had she been taking screenshots where there, you know, processes that we needed to know about things that she was doing. And even if we're inclined, we can view the related clinic, the related events, right? So we can see them all in here and dig in deeper if we need to. So this leads us, right? What do we think? Do we have enough information? Do we think something bad has happened? Or should we just go ahead and close this ticket? If we're not happy and we want more information, a couple of things we can do. We can jump into the logs and go hunting. But before we do that, I usually like to come here to workbooks, which is one of my favorite tools here. So workbooks uh, are another word for dashboards inside Sentinel. We have workbooks and playbooks and notebooks. Oh my. Um, and Microsoft, we like to make things, you know, confusing. So we have similarly named products, as you know. But like I said, workbooks are dashboards. And you may think, ugh, what do I need another dashboard for? But in the world of security operations, these visualizations really help me um, see things that are out of the ordinary. So let's say we're still concerned about Adele. We're going to come into the Azure AD sign and log workbook here. Now, some of these workbooks can be continued to use for incident response, right? So reactive. And some of these workbooks are proactive. This one here, which is literally my favorite one, can be used in both ways, right? So first we're going to look at it in a proactive way. So this is literally looking at all of those Azure AD sign-in logs. And for those of you who look at the sign-in logs over in portal.azure.com, I mean, you know this data is there, but it's not in the most easily consumable format. Uh, but here, again, it's in a graph, a chart, it makes life for me much easier. But here are all those logins, and we can see we've got a bunch of logins from the US. Great, totally what I expect. But I'm seeing some logins from Australia and also from Korea. Is that normal? And if I click on this KR here, I can see who's been logging in from Korea and successfully, right? I could see failures if there were failures here. And um, the 
interesting part about all of this is I happen to know this Andrea Fisher person and she should not be logging in from Korea. So I have an issue right now, right? And I need to go fix it. Same thing for Australia. Who do I have logging in from Australia? Isaiah. And I, I will say during COVID, uh, Ashley and I have done about 50 of these POCs over the course of the last year and used this workbook many times. And there are lots of people working from places they have not told their managers they were working from. So we've seen some Costa Rica's in here. We've seen some Belgium's in here that were benign, but we've also seen some bad things in here, right? We've also found some users who were compromised just from this single workbook, especially if we see something like, you know, six failure, 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 success, right? We can see that someone has managed to guess that password. We were talking about how I might use this in that continued investigation for Adele, right? That brute force attack. I can come in here and I can look for Adele's just her sign-ins, right? Right now we're looking at everybody's, but maybe I just want to look at Adele's just to give me a nicer viewpoint of where she's logging in from. Again, the Australia, right? And lots of failures, right? This is bad, right? Failure, 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 success, like we said, right? This means that brute force attack finally worked. I can also see what device has this person been logging in from, right? And actually I'm gonna drop this back to everyone so you can see more data. But maybe you thought you got rid of all the Windows 7 devices, right? And so you come in here and you're like, wait a second, I thought we got rid of, pretend that says Windows 7, but Windows 7, it could be Windows XP, could be Vista, believe it or not, uh, over the course of the last year. We have seen a lot of old OSs jump online, mostly because parents are handing off those laptops to their children for homeschooling. Uh, now that the kids are back in school, we've seen less of it, but I'm sure it's still out there. We don't want people logging into our domain with Windows XP or Vista because those devices aren't patched, right? You can also get some cool information down here on uh, problems that users are having signing in. Right, the user didn't pass the MFA challenge. The user entered an expired password. Sometimes these are benign, but sometimes they could be something suspicious, right? Uh, so this is just one of the workbooks that's especially helpful when it comes to that zero trust on identity. I'll show you my other favorite one. Again, that can be uh, both proactive and reactive for us. It's called Insecure Protocols. This particular workbook, it's um, helpful even if all you have is Azure AD connected. But if you have that MMA agent on your file servers and your domain controllers, we get even more compelling information. You can see for me, I've got some insecure protocols for SMB, or here as it says, protoballs, probably need to fix them. Uh, I've got some issues with SMB v1 and with Azure AD legacy off. So if I click on this SMB tab, I can see here that CM1, which is my configuration, my SCCM server, and DC1, which are my domain controller, are both serving up old SMB v1 shares, right? And SMB v1 is an outdated protocol that is much more easily compromised than the newer protocols. Same thing that we have when it comes to the legacy auth for Azure Active Directory, right? Uh, between now and October of 2022, Microsoft is actually going to disable these. Most of these are coming in through Exchange Online. Things like IMAP and POP3, there's no reason that users should be logging in with IMAP and POP3. And you may think that's not a big deal, but both IMAP and POP3 bypass MFA. So if you're using MFA or conditional access, it is not enough to keep you safe you need to disable those protocols, whether that's using conditional access, whether that's turning them off on the exchange server, however you wanna do that. But this lets us see who is using those legacy authentications and lets us go find those people and fix that problem so we can disable those accounts and shrink our attack surface, right? My favorite part of that is this one here where we can see those legacy auths by sign in. So Joni and Lee and Adele, she's always a troublemaker, and Alex, right? Those people we need to have a quick talk to and see why is this happening? 
Sometimes I see COP3, maybe an old printer is using this as an SMTP gateway, right? They're using POP instead, um, but uh, really no valid reason to have these lingering around. Now, this is not necessarily identity related, but some cool stuff here um, that makes our managers happy. If there are managers on here, I apologize. But if your manager is anything like my manager, this uh, security operations efficiency workbook will make them very happy. This shows us how many red alerts have we had? How many orange alerts? Who's been closing them? How fast have they been getting closed? What alerts are we seeing the most? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from cloud app security? Are they coming from the firewall? Where are we seeing them, right? So this is a great workbook. And honestly, every single workbook in here has value. And one of the nice things is that you can absolutely create your own workbooks. You can steal teeny tiny parts from other people's, right? Or you can make your own. Like one of my favorite ones, and again, this can be both proactive and reactive. Is that not what it's called? Oh, it's under my workbooks. Login by location. If I want to see anything that looks strange, do, do, do. All right. Again, this is the main location where I expect people to be logging in from. I do not expect these, right? So I need to start digging in and figuring out what these strange locations are. So again, this is just coming from the Azure AD sign-in logs, but it's giving me a visual representation to see who's logging in from where and what I should be worried about, right? I think this one is Korea, this one is Australia, right? Uh, so I created this one myself. They are, if you don't feel confident, there's a ton of these if you go into community here, uh, down at the bottom, for those of you that are familiar with GitHub, a whole set of things you can beg, borrow, and steal from here. A bunch of pre-configured workbooks that are shared amongst other people on things they liked and found helpful out here on the GitHub. Well, let's talk quickly. I know we're, uh, I must be talking fast today. It usually takes me a lot longer than this. Um, but let's get back into looking at the automation. When it comes to automating, there's two methodologies here that we can deal with. And one is just creating the automation rule, which can do something like, uh, we'll just call it test. When I get an alert, I'm gonna automatically, so those things we were doing before manually, I can automatically assign it to me or Grady or to a group, right? I can automatically assign it to the group and then I can change it from new to active, right? So it could be just something as simple as that, or I could get super fancy and add some of these playbooks. And the playbooks are by far the coolest stuff that we have, I think, when it comes to making your life as a security person uh, easier. There's this whole group of pre-configured playbook templates. And again, you can see the ones that are in use are ones that I am in fact using, right? So block an Azure AD user, block an IP in the Cisco firewall, right? Block an IP in Palo, uh, create a JIRA ticket, create a ServiceNow ticket, right? All of those things we talked about earlier. If you're using Carbon Black or CrowdStrike, you're using Alien Vault. All of these are here and they're pre-configured for you to, like I said, just steal from. Maybe you decide if you get a specific alert, you're going to automatically isolate that endpoint, right? Or maybe even with these, we can be super specific. So if this happens after Friday 5 p.m. before Monday 8 a.m., we're going to do these actions, right? Because that's the weekend. And so we're just going to automatically disable the user or automatically isolate that endpoint and send them an email so that when we get back in the office on Monday, we can research it, right? Or maybe our permanent decision is anytime we get a brute force attack, 
right? We're going to log that user out, reset their password, and make sure that um, MFA is turned on. All, that's really the whole key here is we don't want you to get more alerts to give you more work. We want the alerts to work for you, right? When something happens, let the tool handle that logic. You know, I've had a lot of conversations about this lately, and it really depends on your security philosophy. But, you know, so many people, and, I, you know, as a former admin myself, they don't want to make a mistake, right? Maybe the user wasn't really compromised and I made them change their password and people hate that, right? Um, so they want to do a lot of research before they do that. And that's fine, right? That's a decision we all get to make. But you know what we're seeing a lot of the larger companies do is the minute they get something, a red alert that's like a password spray or something that's super severe, they take that action immediately because better to uh, discombobulate that user than to let a bad guy into our environment for untold you know, minutes, hours, days, and then end up with ransomware or you know, having to report it to the New York Times. You know, I don't say any of that to scare y'all, but just to tell you what we see out going on in the world, right? The trend is toward automating those responses just immediately. Again, up to y'all to make those decisions. Um, we have some other great features here. We have threat intelligence features that allows you to come in. Certainly if you subscribe to something like Taxi or Anomaly and you are bringing that, you can bring that information in via the data connectors. But if you don't, you can absolutely bring in your own. If you are seeing certain attacks coming in from a particular IP address, or a particular URL, right? You can absolutely come in here and add this and it will start alerting on that information. We also have watch lists, another new feature. And the cool part about watch lists is we can say, um, you know, sometimes you need to correlate security events with non-security data sources, like maybe you have a list of terminated employees, or even maybe you have a list of C-level execs, and you want to correlate that information with the other data, right? So if, if an attack happens against somebody on the VIP list, I'm going to take more action or faster action, maybe. Just depends on you guys. Or the safe IP list, right? If you get an alert from these IPs, just automatically close it, right? Don't tell me about it because I know that's a safe IP. That's the kind of things you can do here with the watch lists. We also have some great pre-written hunting queries. And I always say hunting is you can either be looking for trouble uh, or you can be continuing to research on an incident. So if we see something like, you know, Login attempts from a blocked MFA user, tracking password changes, login attempts using legacy auth, right? We have over 100, um, I have 173 active queries here, and you can see they're all, again, determined by the uh, minor tactics. So maybe I just want to come in here, and I'm looking for lateral movement, right? And so I can run all of these queries and see if anything hits. Now, if you see it's got a star, that means it's one of my favorites. And every time I come to hunting, it runs, right? So I don't even have to tell it to run. It's going to run automatically for me. So do I want to see hosts with new logons? I just view the results. And that takes me into the hunting page. And I can take a look and see are these things that I'm concerned about, right? Again, these are on my config man server. It's never seen these logins before. Do I need to take action and do anything about it? I'll show you one that's been super, super valuable lately is the, and I don't think I have anything that'll fire this off in my lab, but the um, after Solara Gate, one of the biggest attack features has been coming in via phishing is that application consent. I, I liken this to, you know, when you're, in Facebook and you want to play one of the games and it says, 
hey, um, if you want to play the game, sure, but you're going to give us access to all of your contacts, right? That's consent. So uh, having this happen in your environment, honestly, our recommendation is to turn this off. But in Azure AD, consent is on by default. That's another conversation we can have for another time. But let's run the query. Oh, I do have some, so let's take a look. So someone has been given consent, and let's see who they are and what they've given consent to. So it looks like Brian, oh, I don't have to talk to Brian, um, has given consent to the Microsoft Graph and to Docs Rendering Public. I don't know what that is, but he's added a service principal name. He's added delegated permissions granting. I don't know that I want this guy doing that kind of stuff. I don't know anything about these apps. Sometimes you'll see a bunch of different apps in here, right? So this is something that could be suspicious behavior that we can go back and hunt, right? I've been talking for a long time. I think there are some questions that I was missing in the window. Is there anything I need to? Uh... Yeah, so Sean has a lot of questions around IPv6, and it's kind of more directed to what the Azure AD team is going to be doing about determining location for those uh, IP addresses. I I've posted the articles I'm able to find. The, the best I'm able to do right now is determine location by GPS coordinates, which is a preview feature. Um, but if you have anything to add there, Andrea, that is a question that's occurring right now. No, it's honestly, Sean, same issue everybody we're having, right, is how do we pinpoint those locations? Certainly something that the product group is actively working on uh, to help us get that better view, especially since IPv6 is becoming more and more prevalent. So I don't have a timeline for you today, but just do know that it's being worked on. I don't know if there's anything else. I'm happy to show a little more or answer some more questions. I must have talked exceptionally fast today. I'm usually running out of time. Ashley, is there anything you think I missed that we should go back and cover? No, I don't think I see anything else. That's it. I'll show you guys a fun, uh, like I said, I suggest if you guys are interested in Sentinel signing up for the private preview because you get a sneak preview at some of the new features. And I'm going to show you one that has been making my life a lot easier. Uh, you know, again, we don't want you to um, have alert fatigue. Right. That's that sometimes that's the scary part about turning things like this on is right. Oh, my God, I'm going to get more and more alerts. What am I going to do? So we don't want you a to get false alerts and um, we definitely don't want you to get alerts you don't need. So one of the ways we go about that is we group these together when we can. Right. Sometimes an alert is just one alert for an incident. Sometimes you can see here at seven. I think I might have one even bigger than that. Uh, but regardless, but one of the things is sometimes, so you've got three or two, right? Uh, sometimes one of these specific alerts may fire a lot and it might need some maintenance for us. So let's just imagine one of these, let's think password spread, right? So let's go into analytics. And like I said, this is a preview feature. So it, the column doesn't even have a name yet, but you see this little up and down arrow? So with this one, this is called the incident tuning preview. So if I had a recommendation, if the tool, the machine learning was like, you know what, you're always getting false alerts from 70.22, we'd see a little light bulb based on one of these, but I'm going to show you what the inside looks like. So, um, Cause that's the key is I don't want you to spend all of your time messing around configuring these tools. But it's this new tuning insights section here, right? It's going to tell you which of these, right? So what users keep firing this alert? Um, so maybe these are false positives and I need to adjust the rule. And if they were, I could literally right click and be like, stop telling me about Henrietta. Stop telling me about Patty because I know those are safe, right? So we're always working to make this tool smarter and to save you time. I, Ashley, you know, knows I stole this uh, from somebody yesterday. They said that you know noise is the enemy of speed. So we don't want you to spend time looking at stuff that doesn't matter. 
we want you to be spending your time quickly resolving incidents that are important. Okay, that's all I got. All right, so I'll take back over um, and paste my final slide if that's all right. And we'll go to this guy. So if you have any questions about Sentinel, uh, I put my email here for you to reach out to me. Um, Tony will also paste it um, into the YouTube channel. And I also put in the Forrester total economic impact report for Sentinel in the cost savings. Um, but please, if, you, if you're interested in a POC, email me and I'll make sure to direct it to the right security specialist. And we look forward to helping you. And if you have any more questions, uh, 10 more minutes, so feel free. He wants to see some more dashboards, so I'll get rid of my presentation and paste my <laughs> chat. Absolutely. Hang on, let me reshare. All right. So let's pop back and let's take a couple looks at another fun one as we look specifically at the Azure AD sign in logs. But there's another one here that's going to show the audit logs, the activity, and the sign in logs. And like I said, all of these are editable. You literally come up to here and say edit. But this one is logins by results. And this may be too small for you guys to see, but I can see successful logins versus invalid username or password versus user did not pass the MFA challenge. I can see where those successful logins came from, right? So I see successful logins from Korea. Holy crap, right? Same kind of information. What kind of stuff is happening in the audit logs? That is a lot of ad service principal names. Actually, I'm actually worried about that. I don't know why I have so many ad service principal names in my environment, right? A lot of change password self-service, right? Is that something? You know, you'll start looking at these. I usually look at them once a week and your eye will start to see when something is out of the ordinary. Another great one to talk about, and you can see again, Right, we have everything in here, Azure Firewall, a cost workbook, so you can see which logs cost the most. Uh, you know, normally it's firewall or security events, just to be honest with you, but if you wanna dig in and see which specific tables are costing the most, and there's everything in here from Linux to uh, exchange compromise hunting. This one was published right after Solargate. Uh, but I'll show you another one of the ones that I use a lot, which is do, do, do the Office 365 one. And this helps you look over time at patterns, right? So you're looking here, most of these peaks are on Monday, right? Monday gets you way more email than any other day. But when you think at something like this, you're like, holy crap, what happened on that day? That was July 28th. Do I need to go back in the hunting logs and see what happened on July 28th? because maybe somebody came in here and did something they should have, right? Maybe somebody deleted a bunch of files. Maybe somebody created a bunch of files, but I could literally pivot from here into the hunting logs and start trying to track that information down, right? Or some of the other cool stuff that we can see in this particular one, we can see there's been some permissions on folders that have been modified. Somebody created a new safe links policy in Office ATP. I'm the only one that should be doing that. Who did that? Because I know I didn't do it, right? All that kind of information is in here. Or even just, you know, a lot of people find this one helpful, which is what are the top 10 sites? Who's visiting which sites the most, right? You can get that information. Or who is doing the most, right? The service account should always be the one that's taking the most action. So if you ever see something other than the service account, you should be worried, right? And what do I want to see? What has AM Fisher been doing? Accessing email, previewing files, sending. All right, well, that's normal. But again, like if we came in here and we saw hard deletes, we might freak out and want to go do some more research, right? All of these workbooks have their own 
value and power. And you know what, I'm gonna pivot into the big lab just so you guys can see what some of these firewall workbooks look like and things like that. Um, this is interesting too, here on this main page, this potential, potential malicious events page, for the very first time, I've actually seen customer data. Normally in these POCs, I never see anything here, but orange means that some PC internal to your organization is, is sending data outbound to a known command and control server. And if it's red, it's the opposite way around, right? Red means something is injecting data. So we actually saw this at a customer yesterday and we were like, oh crap. Um, but for the workbooks for things like, let's find the Palo Alto workbook. Oh, and I should show you all that too. So you can see here too, is if those up workbooks get updated on the back end, right? You can just come in here and update the workbook just like we did with the rule. They're always finagling these and making them better, right? So let's we want to look at the Palo overview. Again, I'm not a networking expert, so I don't know that I can absolutely tell you what these uh, are telling you, <laughs> but you can see uh, you know, the traffic coming in, the event severity. Of course, it's going to take forever to load. This should not take this long, guys, sorry. But it's a shared lab, so sometimes that data, sometimes 20 other people are inside of it looking at the same thing you are. It's also like the law of demos. There we go. So again, we can look at patterns over time, right? Interesting, there's literally no data over the weekend. Is that a problem or is it literally that nobody was doing anything? But all of the workbooks are meant to I just say to sort of spur your imagination on to see, you know, did something bad happen? Do I need to worry about it? What's going on, right? And again, looking at them, I don't know if this one has anything at all, but this is the threat workbook. Yeah. Um, but there are just so many interesting ones to take a look at. We talked about, you know, uh, which data is taking up the most, right? The Azure Diagnostic Logs are by far the biggest ones here. And uh, I'm Ashley briefly mentioned, but most of the um, M365 logs can be ingested at no cost. So that's why it says is billable means false. So if you see the blue bar, it means yes, you're ingesting this data, but it's not costing you anything, right? And we can take around and look at the cost analysis or the data latency, right? All of that information is here for you to take a quick peek at. So it does look like there's some latency here on the usage table. So, but I am definitely going to officially stop talking and thank you all for joining us. And if anybody has any questions, please reach out to Tony, Ashley, me. We look forward to seeing you soon for the next one. Thanks, Andrea and Ashley. Uh, so great job, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone next week on our uh, for our next session. Have a good day.